When I was doing my private pilot cross-country training, I wasn't told very much about selecting altitude. Flying east or west determined whether to fly even or odd thousands plus 500 feet. Otherwise, I needed to stay out of the clouds and above any obstacles. <laughs> While that advice got me through my private pilot training in the Midwest, as I flew more and more places, I realized that spending more time planning what altitude to fly was important to keep me legal and safe. In this video, I'll introduce six questions that I use to determine what altitude to fly, including one that many students forget. If you recall from our last video, a friend has convinced you to fly down to Clear Lake, Iowa to visit the Surf Ballroom and the Buddy Holly Memorial. We took time to map our route from KRST to the nearest airport at KMCW. Now we need to figure out what altitude to use. To help, we need three additional pieces of information. The current sky conditions, the temperature, and the temperatures and winds aloft. According to the METAR, the skies are clear and the temperature is 24 degrees Celsius. We'll review the winds aloft report in a minute. But for now, let's explore the questions one at a time. Question one. What is the lowest we can fly? We'll start with the minimum elevation figures, or MEFs. The MEFs are the blue numbers on your sectional chart inside each quadrangle formed by the lines of latitude and the lines of longitude. Because of the way MEFs are calculated, if your charts are current and you stay above that number, you should have at least 100 feet of obstacle clearance. <laughs> However, 100 feet doesn't leave much room for error. So, if your route is over congested areas, I'd recommend staying at least 1,000 feet above the MEF. If your route is over non-congested areas, we'll only add 500 feet. Doing this will ensure compliance with 14 CFR 91.119 and provide a safety buffer. Looking at the route for our trip, the largest MEF is 30 or 3,000 feet. Since this is not over congested airspace, we'll add 500 feet. So, the lowest we should cruise is 3,500 feet MSL. Question 2. What's the highest we can fly? There are several factors to consider here. First is the service ceiling of the aircraft. By definition, the service ceiling is the altitude at which the aircraft can no longer climb 100 feet per minute. While climbing higher is possible, it isn't practical. The Archer service ceiling is found on the climb performance chart in the POH, and in our case it's 14,085 feet. Second, 14 CFR 91.211 states that to be able to fly at 14,085 feet you need oxygen. If you don't have oxygen, to be legal and safe you need to stay below 12,500 feet MSL. And at night, if you don't have oxygen, the FAA recommends staying below 10,000 feet MSL. The third factor is how far you're going. My rule of thumb is, unless I have to be above a certain altitude to avoid obstacles, I should reach cruising altitude within 30% of the total distance. A quick measurement shows our trip to be 58 nautical miles, so we should reach cruise altitude at no further than 18 nautical miles from KRST. Using the time, fuel, and distance to climb chart backwards for 18 nautical miles shows that the today's temperature of 24 degrees Celsius, we should estimate 5,500 feet as our maximum altitude. <laughs> Question 3. How can we stay out of the clouds? For VFR flight, the distance you need to stay away from the clouds varies by the airspace you're in. The largest cloud clearance requirements occur in class ECHO above 10,000 feet MSL. Here, you must be at least 1,000 feet above, 1,000 feet below, and one mile laterally from the clouds. Because things can change quickly and it's hard to actually determine the true distance away from clouds, for safety, I'd recommend planning at least 1,000 feet above or below any ceilings, regardless of the airspace. Quick tip, remember that METARs and TAFs report cloud levels in AGL, so you'll need to convert them to MSL when planning cruise altitudes. In our case, the current forecast is clear skies, so clouds won't be a factor. Question 4. How can we avoid airspace issues? Does your route of flight take you through the boundaries of Class Bravo airspace? What about military operations areas, restricted, or other special use airspaces? Knowing the vertical boundaries of those airspaces and staying above or below them can keep you out of trouble. In our case, there's nothing but Class Delta and Echo airspace, so altitude is at our discretion. Question 5. What direction are we flying? 14 CFR 91.159 states if you're above 3,000 AGL and below 18,000 feet MSL, you should use the following altitudes. 
For magnetic courses between 0 and 179 degrees, choose odd thousands plus 500 feet, or 3,500, 5,500, 7,500, etc. For magnetic courses between 180 and 359 degrees, choose even thousands plus 500. Examples are 4,500, 6,500, 8,500, and so on. <laughs> I found these rules really hard to remember. What worked for me was the goofy saying, east is odd and west is even odder. Do you have other ways to remember these altitudes? If so, I'd love to hear them. Please share them in the comments below. For our flight, the magnetic course is 219 degrees. This means between 3,000 AGL and 18,000 MSL, we should plan even thousands plus 500 feet. From questions 1 and 2, we know we should be between 3,500 and 5,500 feet MSL. Using airport elevations along our route, or KRST 1317, KAUM 1234, Verl de Beel 1180, and KMCW 1213, we can estimate average ground level to be 1,236 feet MSL. That means the magnetic direction rules kick in at 1,236 feet plus 3,000 or 4,236 feet MSL. At this point, the only altitudes we haven't disqualified are 3,500 if we want to fly below 3,000 AGL and 4,500 if we want to fly higher. Oh, oh, before I forget, if you're finding this information helpful, could you please click the like button and consider subscribing? <laughs> Thanks. Now, on to the question that most students forget. Question number six, where are the most favorable winds? Favorable winds can mean a significant savings of time and fuel, especially on longer trips. For our trip, the winds aloft look like this. <laughs> Using our flight calculator shows a tailwind of between 1 to 3 knots at 3,000 feet and a headwind of between 0 to 3 knots at 6,000 feet. So in our case, the difference is at most 5 knots. <laughs> That's pretty negligible. However, for longer trips or stronger winds, the difference could be significant. Since there isn't much advantage at either altitude, I'm going to choose 4,500 feet MSL to give a little more room between the airplane and any obstacles. So there you go. <laughs> Answering these six questions in order practically made our altitude decision for us. <laughs> so again, if this video was helpful, please click the thumbs up and consider clicking subscribe. If you have a favorite method for remembering whether to use even or odd numbered altitudes, please remember to put that in the comments section below. And please share this with two friends who might be struggling with cross-country planning. As always, thank you for watching, fly safely, and I'll see you next time.